Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's good to see you. It's good to worship with you this morning. And um, so you know how John has been semi complaining about all the books that I've been <laughs> handing him throughout this Minor Prophet series. Well, today's my turn. So uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Malachi. And um, yeah, so I'll give you a second to turn to that. Um, and yeah, will you pray as we hear the word of God? Lord, open our ears to um, listen to what you have to say to us this morning. We pray that um, as we glance at this book of Malachi, that you will teach us truth, teach us um, more about you, teach us about more about who you've called us to be. May your spirit speak through your servant this morning, um, and if there's any truth, may it land in our hearts. We pray and ask all this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Um, in the book of Malachi, I'll be jumping throughout the, sorry? Oh, go to Matthew, go back one book. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's where it is. Um, yeah, so we'll be jumping throughout this book, um, but we'll start off this way, at the very beginning. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? At first glance, the Israelites' rebuttal to God seems a bit rude, a bit petulant. I have loved you, God says. How? This isn't an innocent how, like a kid asking, you know, how does the sun rise? Or how come leaves on the tree are green? This isn't a simple inquiry. This how is loaded. You can hear the accusation in the Israelites. You can feel their sense of disbelief in God's promise. How exactly have you loved this? You can sense in this book of Malachi that the people are doubting that what God was saying was true at all. And on the one hand, perhaps they had really good reason to question why, to question God's love. You see, at this point in history, in the book of Malachi, Israel was really not in their glory days anymore as a nation. They were kind of on a downward trajectory. If you remember throughout the series of minor prophets, we have heard many, many prophets keep saying to the Israelites, you know, Turn from your evil ways, return to me. Many have warned the nation of Israel that, you know, if you don't, you're going to face destruction. But return to me and I'll return to you. Well, guess what? Apparently, all those list of prophets did nothing to change Israel's heart. The Babylonians came, they totally destroyed Jerusalem, they sent all the people of Israel into exile. And now the Israelites had only just returned. They'd only just returned back to the land Israel after being homeless for 70 long years. They had returned home to Israel to find that the land they once left, this glorious land, was now desolate, in disarray, filled with crime, filled with trouble. Rather than being, you know, the glorious nation that they had been under King David, under King Solomon, they were now a forgotten people amongst the nations of the world. I mean, their captors had only really let them go because they were so insignificant now, politically. They were mere pawns in conflicts involving much bigger and much grander nations. The temple where they worshiped was only a pale comparison to that great temple King Solomon built. Like everything was just not as great as it used to be. Their crops, while not failing outright, you know, they, they weren't thriving either, and their livelihoods were all being threatened. All the while, they were offering sacrifices. They were sending up their prayers to the Lord. They were treating each other kindly enough, paying whatever tithes they had to. But nothing was seeming to happen. Nothing was happening on God's side. There seemed to be no benefit, whether economically, politically, or socially, to be 
called God's children at this point in time. So when God says, I have loved you at the beginning of Malachi, perhaps Israel is wise to ask, how exactly? Because at least in their eyes, they were keeping their part of the bargain. God definitely wasn't. At least from where Israel stood, God wasn't acting fairly. But you see, I think Israel's problem was that they assumed that this relationship that they had with the divine creator of the universe was somehow transactional. The people of Israel believed that if they kept up the end of the bargain, acted good and religious enough, that God was contractually obligated on his end to pour out his blessings in return. They thought of their relationship with God as transactional because I think our default position is to think of relationships as transactional. Our default position is to think that we enter into relationships so that we get something in return. We live in a world where most of our relationships are defined by mutual benefits. You know, if I scratch your back, you better scratch mine. If I pay you for something, I expect goods and services in return. If I invest in you personally and in this relationship, I want a return for that investment. Even if I'm going to volunteer and donate myself, if I'm really altruistic, I usually want to see some benefit from that experience, don't I? And we're definitely transactional in the fact that we don't like getting the raw end of a deal. <laughs> in our lives, we work hard to make sure that we get our money's worth, or even better, we get a bargain. I remember in my last class at seminary, um, I realized all of a sudden, this great realization that all I had to do in this class was pass, <laughs> and I was going to get my degree. You know? I'd never been in that position in my life. There was no further degree that I was supposed to apply to where my grades mattered. There was no scholarships that I had to keep up to get my GPA up for. I had no motivation to get a good grade. All I had to do was pass, and I get my degree. And so what happened is that I put in the bare minimum amount of effort needed to pass that class. It was completely transactional. If I put in the bare minimum, you give me a C, and I'll get my degree. Thank you very much. And this is exactly what the Israelites were doing in the book of Malachi. They took a look at the dire straits they were currently in, and they took a look at the investments they were putting into their relationship with God, and decided that for whatever reason, they were getting the raw end of the deal with God. In the book of Malachi, we see a group of people who obviously believed that God wasn't holding up his end of the bargain. The devotion and service to God were obviously not yielding the results they wanted. As a relationship, this was really not working out for them. It had no benefit to them. And that's because their relationship to God was strictly a transactional one. It was transactional religion. So as we go through the book of Malachi today, I want us to see that Transactional religion destroys our relationship to God and to each other. This transactional religion destroyed the relationship of the Israelites to God in two ways, I see. First, in the way they worshiped this creator God. And second, in the way they carried out and lived out their faith in the world. So first, the way they worshiped. In chapter one, we see that God takes issue with the, with the way the Israelites were worshipping. In chapter 1, verse 6, I'm reading. Um, a son honors his father, and a slave his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? This is God speaking to the Israelites. If I am a master, where is the respect due me? But it, it is you, priests, who show contempt for my name. And the Israelites ask, But how have we shown contempt for your name? by offering defiled food on my altar. But how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible, 
When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? And going on to verse 12. But you profane the sacrifice by saying, the Lord's table is defiled, its food is contemptible, and you say, what a burden. You sniff at it contemptuously. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands? Cursed is the cheat who, who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal instead. For I am a great king, and my name is to be feared among the nations. And the problem, I don't think, is necessarily rooted in the fact that the animals the Israelites were bringing to, to the Lord were lame and diseased. After all, you know, this is the same God who looked at the widow who threw two measly coins and blessed and honored her blessing and offering. This is the same God who saw a boy bring a measly five loaves and two fishes and said that I will take that and I will use it. It isn't, I don't think it's the quality of the gift that's at the heart of the problem. It's transactional religion. Because transactional religion dictates that if we offer up something in worship, whether it's our time, our money, our sacrifices, we should benefit from it. The Israelites started offering deficient animals because it no longer benefited them to give their very best. Their offerings were not yielding the results they were expecting and so their motivation to worship was gone and the whole deal was becoming, as it says in verse 13, a burden. They decided to only worship God at the level that was convenient for them. They put in the least amount of effort possible to stay on God's right side. They were offering food to God that they would never dream of offering to their governor or to any other important person who came to their house. And it, Scripture says they did have acceptable offerings. But they chose instead to give something less. All meaning had been stripped from their worship because worship rather than being a moment when we meet God and He meets us in community and we are changed as a result, it becomes strictly a transaction of goods and services. I scratch your back, you scratch mine. But in the book of Malachi, the transactional religion of the Israelites did not just destroy their worship of God. It also destroyed the ways they lived out their faith in the world. In chapter 3, um, verse 13, 15, it reads, you, know, you have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord, and yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it's futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we will call the arrogant blessed. Certainly even evildoers prosper. And even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. The Israelites have decided that not only is the sacrificial system useless, because it's not working to their advantage, but also living a godly life as a whole was not beneficial to them because it was not producing the results they wanted to see in their own lives. It seemed more prudent and more prosperous to live as evildoers in that time. And it seemed like they could get away with anything and God wasn't punishing them, so why not? And I think in our world that temptation can seem great too. We live in a world where the wicked still prosper where the good people tend to get trampled on. We live in a world where it's more advantageous to hide your religion than to spread the gospel. We live in a world where it's not necessarily going to help your business or your career to be honest and truthful and graceful and loving. More often than not, being that way only lends you in a world of hurt. It seems in every sphere of life, seeking first the kingdom of heaven is not as great as seeking first our own interests and our own survival. 
We live in a world where it's hard to be Christian. And the temptation is to only live as Christianly as is convenient to us. This is transactional religion. It's a religion based on personal benefits and personal rewards. It justifies behavior by the goods it produces instead of the goodness of the actions themselves. It calls us to obey God simply because obeying Him is beneficial to our lives and disobeying Him is potentially perilous. It's a religion that chooses to count the cost, that calculates the risks and seeks to do the bare minimum. It's a religion that's centered on maximizing our personal benefit for minimum effort. And transactional religion completely misses the point of the whole thing. In Malachi, I think God sees his transactional religion, but he's calling us and he was calling Israel to something higher and something better than that. To close out, I'd like to talk about Three things I think God says in Malachi. Showing us why we should live a faith, a life of faith and obedience beyond simply getting what's good for us. First, I think God calls us to obedience and faith to live for Him. Not for transactional benefits, but because we are part of a covenant with Him. In verse 2, in chapter 2, verse 5, it reads, My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, he's speaking about a believer. And I gave them to him, this call for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. This covenant that we're a part of, it goes back to Abraham. It carries throughout the ages God's promise that he will be our God and we will be his people. And he will never leave nor forsake us. This covenant binds us to him. And I think oftentimes the temptation is to think that we're putting in all this work and God is doing nothing. But if we look through history, we will see that God has more than held up his end of the bargain. The Israelites in Malachi were disgruntled because their current circumstances, as I highlighted at the beginning, were not exactly favorable. And often in our own lives, I think when trials and troubles come, that's when it's most difficult to think about God's love for us. It's when life turns hard that it's tempting to ask, how has God loved us? To think that he's not doing his share. But if we dig deeper, we will remember that this is the God who rescued his people out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery, called them to his own and made them into a nation. We remember that this is the same God who sent prophet after prophet after prophet, calling the people of God to turn back. And even when they failed to do so and got sent to exile and God by all rights could have turned his back and washed his hands of the whole deal. He didn't. He brought them back and made them whole again. This is the same God who, while we were yet sinners and enemies of him and far away from him, sent his only son to die on the cross, save us from hell, restore us as his own. I think this is the same God who has performed Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle in the life of Harbor Church. So that today we're able to gather together, we're able to worship together. In each and every one of our lives, I think we can all point to moments when we know God's love has broken through and touched us. He has more than held up his end of the bargain. And so when he calls us to obey him, to share his love, to offer up our hearts in worship. He asked us to do that because he's already loved us with a love beyond all understanding. He's proved it time and time again. So we're free to live in obedience and faith. Not because we're trying to hold up our end of the deal, but because his infinite love for us frees us to live for him. 
But secondly, I think we obey him because in Malachi, yeah, in Malachi, I think we find that we obey him because when we do so, we bear witness to a broken world of his love and grace. One verse after verse 5 and verse 6, it reads, True instruction was in his mouth of a believer, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from sin. Our obedience is not simply a doorway for rewards, but when God tells us to love him with all our hearts, to love our neighbor as ourselves, he does so because this is how the lost will see the kingdom. This is how the lost will know his love. When he tells us to go and make disciples of all nations, it's because he has chosen us to be his light in the world. And he's empowered us to bring hope by his spirit. When we meet here in worship, when we sing some songs, when we pray for each other, when we hear the word, when we share fellowship, when we break bread, we don't just do that because God has told us to do so or because we like each other. But we do it because that's how God shapes us. That's how he heals us. That's how he redeems us. So that we can be sent as his instrument in the world. So we obey him because we're part of this covenant where he has more than held up his end of the bargain. We obey him because that's how the world will know his love. And we obey him because we know that it will not be in vain. In Malachi 3, right at the end, this one wonderful passage, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evil duel will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire. Not a root or branch will be left of them. But you, who revere my name, the son of righteousness, will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Even though it often seems in this time and age that it doesn't really pay to follow God with all our heart, we can because we know. Because scripture tells us not only in this passage, but time and time and time and time again, that God will honor the righteous. God will not forget the ones who gave their all to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. We may not see the fruit of our obedience in our lifetime, and we may suffer a loss for following and obeying our Lord and Savior, but we can do that confidently because we know in the end he will have ultimate victory. There is no doubt about it. If we offer up our hearts and our lives to him, if we give ourselves to living in obedience to him, our efforts will not be in vain. For in the end, God wins. In the end, righteousness will triumph over evil. Every evildoer will be brought to justice and we will live in peace. In the end, every piece of our hope will be fulfilled. So in the meantime, I challenge each and every one of you, as this book has challenged me, let's walk in obedience. Let's not just do it because we want to curry some favor with God. Let's not just do it because we're afraid we're going to incur some punishment. But let's walk in obedience. Empowered by His Holy Spirit, because He has loved us with an everlasting love. He has chosen each and every one of us to be his instruments of love in the world. And in Jesus Christ, he has promised us the ultimate victory. Will you pray with me?
So Lord, will you take our lives, we offer them up to you, and we ask that you use us for your glory. Lord, we know that we live in a time and an age when it's not exactly easy to be your, to call ourselves your children. But give us strength, give us hope, and give us courage so that we may be light unto the world. We may bring salvation to the lost. We pray and ask all this in your mighty name. Amen.